everybody. We are just I, so, so happy to have a very special guest today. So Antonia Apps, when I ask people, who is the best lawyer around in America? This is a name that I, comes up a lot. And th I think there are a couple of reasons. One, um, she is uh, just a crackerjack litigator. Two, she's been at the thick, at the heart of some of the biggest, most controversial, difficult issues dealing with white collar crime, dealing with institutional uh, financial disasters and other messes, uh, and, uh, and corruption and other great difficult problems. And three, as you'll see, she's really, really persuasive. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Antonia Epps, and thank you so much for being here. You'll tell about your background and how you actually even have a Harvard degree. Uh, Martha, thank you very much, and thanks for the kind words. It's great to be here. It's great to have the opportunity to share with you uh, some of the things that I've done in my career. Uh, I think at your age, it is great that you're thinking about what you want to do next. Maybe you don't have a 10-year plan. Maybe you don't have a 20-year plan. That's fine. But listening to what other people have done sort of 20, 25 years into their career can be a great way to figure out what you want to do with this great opportunity, this law degree. And in fact, my story, in some respects, underscores what's best about this country and the sort of opportunities you will have having a degree from this amazing institution. And it gets more amazing as you get older, believe it or not. Um, so, so what's my background? I actually came to the US when I was 23. I came for the LLM at Harvard. I already had a law degree for, um, at Sydney University. And I'd spent two years studying at Oxford, as maybe some of you uh, have also done. After I graduated from Harvard Law School, I didn't really have a clear vision of what exactly I wanted to do with my life. I knew I loved the practice of law. I loved the intellectual part of it. You know, in law school, you know, the, the nitty legal problems that come your way. I knew I loved that. But I also felt like I wanted to uh, have the sort of human element, get involved with people, understand people, understand behavior. Not that I had any experience in psychology or sociology, believe me. But that was a very interesting thing to me. And that intersection of the legal issues and the social human issues are something that I knew I wanted to do. So what does that mean? I went to a large New York law firm. Um, <laughs> I uh, spent three years at Freed Frank doing most litigation. I did some corporate work, which I wasn't well suited for. Uh, and had the benefit of having a wonderful mentor, a woman by the name of Audrey Strauss, who was the first woman to be chief of the securities fraud unit in the United States Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York. Uh, she, was that, she held that position in 1983. And today, there is also a woman in that position, chief of the securities fraud unit. Unfortunately, the woman today is only the third person to have held that position in the, in the office's history something, maybe a topic for an entirely different discussion. Um, but Audrey inspired me to want to uh, do what she did, to spend some time, a, a part of my career in public service, to be able to get out there and to get in the courtroom, to have the kind of insight you have by having worked and having spent a career in different institutions and different places. So my path, however, to the US Attorney's Office was a bit longer than most. As I said, I grew up in another country. And it took me a very long time to become a citizen of this country. I did not become a citizen until, I was two, until 2006. Uh, I left Freed Frank after three years. I clerked for a Second Circuit judge. And then my uh, personal life took me to Washington, DC. And I joined a sort of a small boutique firm called Kellogg, Huber, Hanson, Todd Evans, and Feigl. It does a lot of litigation. And I was there for nine years, uh, a partner for seven. And the day I became a citizen in 2006, I submitted my application to the United States Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York and joined in 2007. So I spent seven and a half years in the Southern District of New York. Uh, I did a whole host of different cases. I focused pretty early on uh, in white collar crime because that was by then my interest, my passion, sort of things that I liked most. And I ended up trying uh, sort of the headline cases for the office in insider trading. Uh, some, I was lead prosecutor against a hedge fund called SAC Capital, which was uh, run by uh, its founder, Steve Cohen. I prosecuted the most senior, I took to trial the most senior portfolio manager in that institution. I did a number of other insider trading cases, other large Ponzi scheme, white collar cases, not Madoff, 
um, but uh, still uh, Ponzi schemes that were uh, in the uh, tens and hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, and over all that time um, at the U.S. Attorney's Office, I did over 10 trials. I did probably 30 hearings, a dozen appellate arguments, uh, all in seven and a half years. And that's the sort of experience you can get by going into government. And I will say the thing I think that resonates most with me after having done that is really the commitment that you, you feel when you're in public service uh, to, to the job, the integrity, the mission. There really is nothing quite like it. It is an enormous privilege to be able to stand up in the federal court and they're, in my experience, majestic buildings and say, I represent the United States. And that is something which holds, I think, for me, the most powerful moments in my career uh, even though I've done these great trials and these great experiences, that is something that I will, will never forget and never lose and will always appreciate. So um, as many of you know, people who spend time in government, especially in, in New York, tend to leave and uh, all good things must come to an end. And a year ago, I joined a large New York law firm, Millbank, which has a wonderfully strong practice in white collar litigation. I represent large financial companies, banks, issuers, I also represent individuals in front of investigations before the Department of Justice, all the regulatory agencies, both domestic and foreign, and I also do commercial litigation, typically complex commercial litigation, sometimes securities, sometimes uh, just contract law, uh, and so forth. But I, what I want to do today is spend just a couple of minutes on the U.S. Attorney's Office, and then I really want to open it up for questions uh, about any, anything that I've mentioned today. So let's talk about the U.S. Attorney's Office a little bit. Obviously, it's hard to get in, but uh, once you're there, essentially, there's a, there's a lot of great U.S. Attorney's Office across the country. My experience is the Southern District of New York, and so I'm going to talk about how that office is structured. Uh, and I think a lot of them follow a similar model, but each one would be slightly different. And if you're thinking about, at any point in time, going to a particular U.S. Attorney's Office, I strongly recommend you reach out to somebody who's been through that office, who understands how it works, who understands what they're looking for, uh, and understands the admissions process and the, the interview process. So the Southern District. The Southern District uh, is structured as follows. They put every, when, it, when you start, you go into a unit called general crimes for a year. You do every type of federal crime there is. Tri what's called trigger locks, which is a felon in possession, so gun cases. You do credit card fraud, immigration fraud, tax fraud, a uh, bunch of other sort of low-level financial crimes. Uh, and you basically spend a year getting a whole, a ton of cases. You sit on what's called complaint duty, so you'll have one day designated where whenever there's arrest made or a new case comes in, maybe it's just in the investigation stage, and you're on complaint duty, you get the call and you might get 10 cases in one day. And you're on complaint duty every couple of weeks, sometimes once a month, depending on how many people are starting around the time you start. And you keep those cases until you leave the office or they're resolved, whichever is sooner. <laughs> um, hopefully they're resolved well before you leave the office. Um, and then the second year, you usually go to what's called the narcotics unit, uh, which is a unit that specializes in just drug uh, trafficking uh, of a whole host of things. Sometimes it's drug trafficking associated with gangs. Sometimes it's uh, drug trafficking occasionally associated with terrorism, although there are senior units that are focused on terrorism. And essentially, again, you get a bunch of cases, a bit similar, similar process. You have this complaint duty where you, you get essentially <laughs> called, you're designated to be on duty for the day, and you get calls from agents or from wherever, and you get these cases and you keep them uh, for your time at the U.S. Attorney's Office. And so in the end, by the time you're there for a couple of years, you basically have a docket of somewhere between 50 and 100 cases, depending on how fast those cases move. And you hopefully by that time have done some trials. By the end of my uh, second year at the U.S. Attorney's Office, I actually had done five trials, um, usually a week long. So they're the smaller cases that you get, the smaller crimes. It's a great way to cut your teeth, to get comfortable in the courtroom, to learn the skills of trials, direct examinations, cross-examinations, jury addresses, arguing the law to the judge. Jury instructions are very critical a critical component of, of any trial. And uh, then you choose to go into a senior unit. And there are, the senior units have certain specialties. There's uh, now, and they change names over the years, but essentially they form, uh, they, they sort of coalesce around a number of subject matters. 
One of them is terrorism or inter and international narcotics. Um, that used to be terrorism and international narcotics, and they combined the two because there, there's actually a lot of overlap uh, now. There was, particularly with sort of some of the uh, drug trade out of, out of Afghanistan. Then there's a unit, there are two units in white collar crime. One is called complex frauds, and one is called securities frauds. And essentially, complex fraud is everything but securities fraud. It'll do healthcare fraud, uh, some basic uh, uh, financial fraud, uh, sometimes Ponzi schemes that maybe don't involve securities, um, uh, tax fraud. So a whole host of different frauds are in complex fraud. And then securities fraud focuses on uh, anything involving securities or commodities. So to give you a sense of the breadth of the cases that, and I, w I went into the secure, I specialized into the secure, oh, well, there was two, uh, I, sorry, I left out two other units. Um, one of them is organized crime, and one of them is gangs. Uh, the gangs unit is really quite remarkable. They <laughs> sometimes will arrest literally 40 people. They'll take down an entire gang in one of the New York suburbs in a single sweep which is an organizational feat not to be uh, <laughs> believed. It's really remarkable. Uh, and then they'll just go to trial. Sometimes they'll have trials of six or seven people. Sometimes the trials will last three months. Uh, and these are people who will describe to you in, stri in uh, remarkable detail uh, exactly who they shot, when, and how, and what they did to them. It is uh, a grueling experience and not one for the uh, <laughs> lighthearted. But um, so essentially, uh, when you, oh, let me talk about the securities unit, because I actually spent uh, nearly five years in the securities unit, it's what I chose to specialize in. And there are a whole breadth of sort of things that you, you investigate and, and, tr and do in the securities unit. We did a lot of uh, investigations in what's now controversial, of course, in the uh, mortgage-backed securities area uh, with financial institutions around the financial crisis investing in uh, the, uh, buying and selling securities uh, and the problems with their balance sheet. You do investigations into Ponzi schemes. Uh, so people who, I don't know if you know what a Ponzi scheme is, basically pe people who lie about <laughs> investments they're, they're making take money in and instead of actually making the investments they're telling people they're making, they're taking new investor money in and paying out returns to the old investors to fool everybody into believing there's actually a real legitimate investment. There's all sorts of other securities fraud, accounting fraud cases, you know, the very famous ones from years ago, uh, the likes of which we haven't seen in a long time, things like WorldCom, Adelphia, where whole companies imploded essentially because of fraudulent accounting schemes. Uh, there's uh, misrepresentation cases in connection with securities, so basically people selling, uh, pretending to sell one thing and they're, they're really lying about the, real, the, the underlying risks of those securities. Sometimes they're boiler room type cases where it's sort of thing you saw on the Wolf of Wall Street, but uh, at, you know, in different uh, jurisdictions. So those are the sort of things that you can uh, do in the securities unit. Uh, and in the terrorism and other units, they have amazing trials, which are often headline cases as well. So that's a brief overview of the U.S. Attorney's Office. What I really wanted to do was open it up for questions and see if anybody has it. And it can be anything about what I've talked about today or anything you want to talk about at all. So, <laughs> Yes. Oh, there's a, there's a mic somewhere. Yes. Hi, I'm Felicia Johnston, um, and I'm a 1L. Um, my dream is to be in a U.S. Attorney's Office one day, and I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about what you did in your career that you think set you up to get that opportunity and advice you would have for people who want to follow that path. So I think, um, so a couple of things. I think it's helpful if you, if, you do, if you go to a law firm, big or small, I think it's helpful to try and get some experience, uh, not necessarily in the courtroom. Uh, I know that's very hard for junior associates, but... Uh, depositions or maybe arguments in court. I mean, maybe not a jury address or what have you, but maybe you can do arguments in court. A lot of big firms now offer very rigorous pro bono programs that you can get into court. Um, and so the more on your feet experience you've had, I think is helpful to some extent. I do think it's very helpful if you've clerked for a judge. Uh, and then I think, you know, a lot of it is about the interview process. And, you know, U.S. Attorney's offices are always going to be looking for somebody with integrity, somebody who's not uh, too, I mean, clearly, you know, part of the job is 
to prosecute people, and the result is deprivation of their liberty. So if you cannot stomach that, it may not be the job for you. On the other hand, you don't want somebody whose mission is to put people in jail. I think you have to have a fair degree of compassion to be a good prosecutor, and I think a lot of U.S. Attorney's Office are very aware of that and look for that. Uh, and then judgment. You know, you have to have good judgment, and they have a series of interviews when you uh, go through the U.S. Attorney's Office and ask you hypothetical questions and all of those kinds of things. Uh, but I think it's really important not to be intimidated by the process, and the best way to do that is to learn about the process from somebody who's recently been through it, somebody who maybe has been through it some time ago. Uh, and I think in all job interviews, I think it's a little bit about presentation. You know, what do you bring to the table? How do you present yourself? Because you have to stand up in court at some point and make an argument on behalf of the government. And are you going to be able to do that? And so really basic things. You know, when you interview, look somebody in the eye. You know, have a bit of conviction and confidence about what you what you're saying, even if you don't, I suppose. Um, you know, what, whatever they say, fake it until you know, until you make it. But you know, make sure you present well, and make sure you pra you know, really investigate and research the job process. <coughs> you know, you should treat career choices and avenues that you want to go down um, as importantly as you treat your job, because if you really want something, you have to work at it. I mean, that's true, unfortunately, for everything in life. There's really no free ride, you, so you have to sort of focus on it. Um, but different U.S. attorneys' offices will have slightly different admission processes, but in the end of the day, at the end of the day, they really want somebody who has the confidence to stand up in court and represent the government and who will have judgment and integrity and not be too sort of lacking in compassion and not be too afraid to, uh, to move forward with, the, with what is required for the job. Yes, uh, Mike. Hi, thank you for so much for speaking with us. Uh, my name is Nick. I'm a 1L. Uh, before coming here, I used to work in compliance, and while I was in the department, a constant theme was the expansion of compliance, sort of the need for more lawyers. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit um, what that was like being on the other end, sort of seeing the uh, this rapid expansion of enforcement and sort of the fallout from 08, basically. Yeah. No, there was, there's was. there been a, a tremendous shift in the industry, in all parts of the industry, uh, since the financial crisis, um, to increase regulation, to inc increase compliance. Uh, and I think part of, the, part of the reason is there's a, you know, a very complex layer of regulations out there, uh, and also just controlling human behavior in some sense. I mean, people... There's always going to be in these large. Fin Were you in a large financial institution? I was in large funds. Yeah. So, well, hedge funds are very. It's interesting. For hedge funds have had, I think, the greatest metamorphosis over the last eight years. Um, but taking the large financial institutions first, I mean, you know, some of these financial institutions are, have worldwide quarter of a million people. You know, by definition, you're going to have people who. Uh, <coughs> want to break the rules uh, and, and seek greater profit for themselves. And it is, it is really critical to have people on the desk, you know, cops on the, you know, on the beat, if you like, within the financial institutions to try and detect that fraud before it gets too far. Now, there's always, you know, big examples of things getting very large. Uh, the London Whale was an example of something that got very large before it was stopped, even though there were clearly compliance offices around. Uh, but there is a huge push in the industry, particularly the financial sector and the, and the large banks, to make sure there's enough compliance people around. I think the really compliance job, frankly, is one of the toughest jobs out there because, you know, the way these financial institutions are set up is, is the, those that generate the profit um, are, tend, tend to be the most powerful within the institution. And compliance and legal, by definition, are not the individuals generating the profit. In fact, they're usually the ones that are cramping down on the profit because they're telling people that you cannot engage in certain behavior that is profitable. And uh, although the appropriate response for a compliance person should be uh, long-term risk, reputational risk to the company, legal risk and legal cost to the company outweigh any particular behavior. Uh, but there has been a huge shift. And you know, hedge funds, I think, 
um, at the time of the financial crisis, very few of them even had that many compliance offices or legal personnel to speak of. I think they felt that they were uh, outside of the, the purview or at least outside of the, the, the watch of the regulators and so uh, really understaffed uh, that center. But I, what was interesting about the hedge fund experience versus the large financial expect, uh, sector, the large financial institutions is just how vulnerable a hedge fund is. I was actually part, one of the things that I did in the securities unit was um, uh, we investigated what's called expert networks. And at the time, uh, in 2007, 2008, basically <coughs> hedge fund professionals or any investor professional could call up what's this uh, sort of uh, next expert network or consulting firm and say, I want to speak to somebody in the industry about how Intel chips work. Because I, as, a, as an investor, I want to understand better how Intel chips work. Well, the problem was these expert networking firms would then reach out to individuals within companies in order to get that information. And then very quickly, in some of the expert networking firms, those company insiders divulged a little bit more than just how an Intel chip works. They started to divulge sales numbers, projections, revenues and margins, information that investors could use to get an edge on the market and an illicit edge on the market to trade ahead of earnings announcements and so forth. So the, the, the government, Southern District of New York, um, prosecuted a series of these expert networking firm employees. Uh, the particular firm prosecuted was Prime and Global Research. I actually tried one of those employees in front of Judge Rakoff in the Southern District of New York. And the theory was basically these insiders were stealing their company's confidential information and for 200 bucks an hour on the phone, giving it to hedge fund professionals. That investigation, I think, woke up the hedge fund industry because as part of that investigation, the government essentially had a very broad reach in subpoenas and, and uh, there was a time later that the government actually searched some funds. And some of these hedge funds were so vulnerable when they got subpoenas uh, and felt they had to disclose it to their investors, some of the investors just pulled all of their money out and the hedge funds went out of business. And so I think what the hedge funds learned from that experience is that <laughs> it is better to have a cop on the beat, if you like, and make sure that your compliance system works. Make sure that you can tell investors who are, have money in their fund that uh, just because they've received a subpoena from the government doesn't mean they're necessarily doing something wrong. And they can represent that they have the internal controls to make sure that their traders are complying with the law. It's just so fascinating. I have two questions. One, um, whether uh, you have been now on both sides, you've been in the government, you've mm -hmm. been in the private sector. <clears throat> what, do you think that the criminal uh, tools are uh, the most effective to try to tamp down bad behavior in the large financial institutions or civil or advising? Or right. what, what, what is the way to change the so behavior? So I think it's interesting. I think the criminal tools are the most effective way to ultimately root out crime and deter crime. And I'm actually, there's a big debate in the industry about whether you go after institutions or individuals. And I actually am a believer that uh, individuals, prosecuting individuals is really the only true deterrent. I do, I do think there are times when it's also appropriate to, 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 to charge corporations and entities, but prosecuting individuals uh, is really, when somebody's actually gonna go to jail, is the true deterrent. But if you're talking about effective um, tools for law enforcement. Some of the criminal tools are really um, without parallel in the civil arena. And some of them are, some of them are obvious, wiretaps, clearly. If you can get people on, on a wire committing a crime, there is no better evidence. Um, there's a lot of powers like search warrants. There's a lot of subpoena power. The grand jury has tremendous power to subpoena people. But one of the most effective tools in law enforcement, actually, is the use of what's called a cooperating witness. So, you know, in sort of colloquial terms, if to flip a witness. And uh, it's actually a very controversial thing at times because some people really object to the notion 
that you're going to allow a cooperating witness, a one individual who was clearly part of a crime and committed a crime, to get some more lenient treatment than the person who is on trial. But it is really the only way to get firsthand eyewitness testimony on the commission of a crime. And particularly in financial crimes, it's very difficult because, you know, unlike in the gangs, the gangs prosecutors will always say this, uh, and they have a point. When you're in the gangs unit and you're prosecuting, there's usually a dead body. You can pretty much work out that, you know, maybe you rule out suicide or whatever, that a crime has been committed. You just have to figure out who's actually pulled the trigger or who was involved, who was helping pull the trigger. In the financial area, there's not usually a dead body. Now, true in the financial crisis, a lot of money was lost, but that doesn't mean a crime was actually committed. A lot of the financial crimes turn on an individual's intent, whether they actually knew what they were doing was wrong, whether they understand the law, understood the law at the time, and actually did actions that were deliberate uh, to affect a, a, a it's, you know, a, a, an outcome that is prohibited by the law. And sometimes the best evidence and the only evidence of that, if it's after the fact and you don't have you know, wiretap evidence real time, is the person's, the defendant's co-conspirator, a cooperating witness. And that individual, uh, in order to get that testimony, the government, as I said, flips this witness. And in, to do that, what they do is they make uh, the co-conspirator, the testifying cooperating witness, plead guilty to all of their crimes, which usually involves the crime with the defendant. And at sentencing, if they testify for the government and they get on the witness stand and they tell the truth, at sentencing, that cooperating witness can get a huge benefit uh, in the amount of the sentence. And in the Southern District of New York, in financial crimes, a lot of cooperating witnesses get time served or almost no time at all. Not true in the, in the usually in, in murders, if you have somebody who's participated in a lot of robberies and murders, they'll serve some time, that, but it'll be significantly reduced from what they would otherwise face. And that is one of, I think, one of the most critical tools in, in law enforcement because, you know, I've done a lot of financial crimes cases where you have a lot of email evidence and email evidence and chats and so forth is critical to corroborating witnesses but emails, uh, if you're a good defense lawyer, you can figure out uh, at least two, if not three or four meanings for a particular email. And uh, you need a cooperating witness quite often to give life and to give meaning and the real meaning to a particular email or documentary evidence. And so I think that's really critical. What's, really, what's actually an, a more controversial issue these days um, is the extent to which, and there's, I think there's gonna be sort of literature that comes out of this over time, the extent to which some of the criminal tools have been curtailed over the years. The Justice Department many years ago um, issued a memo, at uh, the time it was the Holder Memo, which uh, I think gave points to companies for cooperation if they would give up um, privilege over their internal investigations. Uh, and that was subsequently uh, withdrawn and now companies are, the government cannot ask companies to give up privilege over internal investigations uh, in order to get sort of what's called cooperation credit to be treated more leniently um, when, the com when the action against the companies are being considered. And uh, so I think there's, it's interesting, there's some quarters who criticize that sort of movement because that is a, something which would be, make it much easier for prosecutors to, to ferret out crime. Because what happens with internal investigations as companies will hire outside counsel to go in there and interview the witnesses, you know, fresh and get their first unvarnished recollection of what the events were. And then by the time those witnesses, and this I think happened a lot of the financial crisis cases, by the time those witnesses years later appear before the government to talk to the government about what they, uh, what they witnessed, they, their memories were, you know, uh, from years ago, um, you know, they've uh, essentially walked back some of their stories. Uh, I think that m made some of the prosecution of the financial crisis cases very difficult. So you mentioned uh, cooperating witnesses pleading guilty. I want to ask a question about is guilty pleas more generally. I know for federal crimes, the percentage of them that end up pleading out has gone up quite a bit mm -hmm. over the last 
I don't know, 10, 20, 30 years. So I'm wondering what you th think about that and whether you think it's just that so many federal defendants end up waiving their constitutional trial rights and end up just pleading guilty for lower sentences than what they're charged with. Right. Well, so there's a couple of uh, points to that. First, I mean, in the federal system, certainly in the Southern District of New York, you're, you're not supposed to engage in plea bargaining if somebody committed a crime and you have the proof for the crime, then you should um, make sure they plead guilty to what you think the proof actually is. I think there's a lot of stories that have come out in the press over the recent years, particularly in the state system where there is this plea bargaining and people um, uh, have, you know, there's a lot of empirical evidence that people are pleading to things that they maybe didn't do just to get a lower sentence. I personally find that offensive. Um, I think that's wrong. Um, I don't know how we fix that problem. I think that is a real problem for the criminal justice system. Uh, I think the criminal justice system is under incredible pressure with resources to try and fix that kind of problem. Uh, and it's a great thing for you to focus on. Uh, maybe you should uh, <laughs> to try and find a solution. Um, so, in the Southern District, sorry, even in the Southern District of New York, if the, it isn't explicit I, plea bargaining, there must be some incentive for anyone to plea. They must be expecting a lower sentence because of the fact that they plead versus. Yeah. I, I mean, it, you know, look, we we I, the way I was taught. And in, in the Southern District is that you don't just sort of engage in out and out plea bargaining. You know, understand that, I mean, I do think there is a value to guilty pleas at the end of the day. I think from a resource perspective, uh, if, if, you, if there's proof beyond reasonable doubt that somebody committed a crime, that person has a, a constitutional right to go to trial. And frankly, the AUSAs in the Southern District would love nothing more than that that person go to trial. Um, but. But you know that from an institutional perspective, a policy perspective, that doesn't make sense for everybody to go to trial. I, if you're talking about sort of the, the, something that there's in this, you can call fact bargaining, if you like, is you know it, it's rarely as black and white as you see on TV, right? So what is proof beyond reasonable doubt that somebody committed a crime? And maybe you have proof beyond reasonable doubt that somebody, you know went to the robbery, didn't actually pull the trigger, but was clearly present and involved in the robbery. And maybe that person is willing to plead guilty to that robbery, and you can prove that robbery and that the person was present. What if you have suspicions that this individual actually participated in three other robberies, but you have no eyewitness, you have no forensic evidence, and you can't prove it? Is that a plea bargain? Is that to suggest that they should plead guilty just to the one robbery, whatever that gets, and then not uh, try and make them plead guilty to three other robberies that you, you, you feel strongly that they participated in based on what other people have told you, but you simply can't prove it. So that's, that's a, those decisions are actually much more nuanced, I think. The sort of decisions that I, I'm familiar with are so, it can be much more nuanced than just letting somebody cut a deal. And I think prosecutors in the Southern District uh, don't like the notion, at least it's, it runs against you know, what we're trained to do, to think that we're going to uh, fact bargain. And I, some of the cases I took to trial as a junior prosecutor, um, uh, you know, the defense counsel said we would take a plea to the one of the counts and not the three others. They were smaller cases, credit card theft, and, and we said, no, we can prove all three. We'll take it to trial, and we took it to trial because we knew we could prove all, th all you know, three instances of being involved in the particular financial crime at issue. So it does happen. I do think your larger point that there is this plea bargaining, whether in state court or in other courts, who knows, um, is a real issue. And, and, I, and you know, I, th look, I, I really believe in the federal system and I think the prosecutorial system, but mistakes happen, you know? I think, uh, I hope not in the Southern District, <laughs> but I'm sure they have. But across the country in prosecutorial's office, in, people make mistakes. People, prosecutors are human at the end of the day. Maybe they formed a view of the evidence that just isn't warranted. I mean, that's why the adversarial system is really so important, because good defense counsel will make sure the government is put to its proof, whether in a plea or at a trial, to actually get the evidence, to adduce the evidence that shows that a particular defendant is guilty beyond reasonable doubt. That's a really critical part of our system, and it's part of our justice system. And to the extent there are flaws, and there are flaws, uh, I think it's a great project for any of you who want to get involved in uh, trying to fix the future, because that's, that's the, what we should be doing.
Hi. Um, as a current LLM at Harvard Law School, <laughs> I'm really fascinated uh, with your life after the LLM program. Uh, I think we've got a, a few LLMs in the room right now. So I was wondering if you could reflect on um, some of the career aspects and opportunities for the LLMs, especially like I think now time has changed and um, we are aware that we would face a very tough challenge, especially um, we've got JDs. Like, so, and uh, some of us practice like very niche areas of law, like investment arbitration or international arbitration. So I was hoping if you could um, a bit reflect on that. And sorry, Jay. <laughs> well, I think, first of all, I think any degree out of this law school um, gives you enormous opportunities that you otherwise would not have. I really, I really do believe that. Uh, I think it equips you for the challenges that, that you will face ahead. And I, and I think it, it's, it's, it's a way for people to, to determine whether or not you are qualified. Um, the sort of, so I went into general litigation, and at the time I went into it, there was a slight market downturn. I don't think it was um, a huge market down, it wasn't the bottom of the market. These things are cyclical, obviously. Um, and so it was a more general approach, and I was willing to do absolutely anything, essentially. Uh, and you know, you learn, like I think every JD or LLM student leaving a law school, you go to a big law firm or whatever it is you choose to do, it's a steep learning curve and you have to stick it out and tough it out. But each and every one of you are perfectly capable of doing that successfully. Um, I don't know the market on international arbitration. I just, I don't know what jobs there are in that particular field. It's not something I specialize in. But my suggestion with all of these things is to reach out to former Harvard Law School alums who are in that area and ask them, what are, what are the requirements? What are people looking for? What are, what are you interested in? And maybe improve the aspects of your experience that will help you get that job. And I think that's, that's really the best way uh, I, to, to move forward, but I don't particularly know the area that you're talking about and how how specialized you are already and whether whether that's a tough area to go into, but you could sort of reach out and ask. I mean, I really do think everybody, I want to underscore that for everybody in this room, I, I think if you are, whether, whether you just want advice on whether you want to go into a particular area or whether you want advice on how to get somewhere you are pretty sure you want to get, reach out to people. Most alums, most senior people in the profession really want to help you. Um, they may have time constraints, but it will do, do you enormous good to understand more about the areas you want to get into and to understand what's required. And I have to say, you know, I did find it remarkable. I was on the hiring committee at the U.S. Attorney's Office that, you know, folks would show up and not understand some of the basic questions which are asked of every at every interview and people were unprepared for that. And those folks, when you're in an interview process and you have people who come loaded for bear on the questions which are relevant to the particular area or, or particular job and you have others who are not, you're clearly gonna be more impressed by those who are prepared. So I really can't emphasize enough, reach out to people in the area you wanna get into, know what it is that people are looking for and, and be prepared, you know? Hi, um, my name is Isabel, I'm a 1L. Um, I just want to go back to your specialty in financial crime and white collar crime. And obviously this is a very fast evolving field and area, and particularly through the increasing technical complexity and the cross-border nature of, of a lot of the crime that has taken place in recent years. So could you maybe just reflect on how these two trends might change the US um, uh, attorney office approach in uh, tackling white collar crime when they are, A, they are so technical that maybe uh, regulation wise it hasn't really caught up. A case in point would be high frequency trading, for example. And then when it comes to cross-border nature, then how do you reach out to other countries for cooperation? Right. So a couple of things. On the technical specialty, there's really a couple of aspects to that. One is, um, you know, the way the criminal justice system works is you often get prosecutors like in the Southern District of New York who maybe don't have experience in, in um, high frequency trading or understand how it works, but they will partner with other regulatory agencies that have that specialty, like the SEC will have people who 
worked in high frequency trading institutions and are now specialized and they usually come in and brief federal prosecutors, for example, as an institutional matter on how that works. In terms of regulations catching up, in the criminal sphere, you don't prosecute regulations that are catching up. It has to be an intent to violate the law and it has to be a well-stated law. The thing is that most, you know, the, the, the criminal law is actually a, a pretty interesting and flexible tool. You don't need a law which specifically prohibits high frequency trading in order to bring a criminal case. At the end of the day, if you have the right circumstances where there's an individual who is deliberately trying to manipulate the market, market manip manipulation is a crime that's been prosecuted for a, a you know, decades. The fact that, or longer, the fact that um, somebody is doing it through a new mechanism or a new tool is not an obstacle to prosecution. The greatest obstacle to any kind of prosecution like that is the one that Martha raised, which is what's your proof, <laughs> right? There's no dead body. The person could be doing it for a whole host of reasons. One criminal, one not criminal. How do you prove that the reason that motivated this person's behavior was the criminal one? Um, and then your second question was, cross-border. So that's an interesting development, actually. And what you'll find with um, all regulators, not just the criminal authorities, but the civil authorities and SEC, CFTC, and the Justice Department's civil arm, is that there's an, there is an increasing trend towards cross-border coordination, I would say. Um, if you look at the recent FIFA um, indictments out of the Eastern District of New York, uh, there was tremendous coordination with the Swiss authorities about getting evidence and information about now individuals are being extradited from Switzerland to the United States. And that has become much more common as, uh, if you turn back to the financial sector, some of these financial institutions are really spread out all over the world. And, mo and moreover, some of the individuals who will work this year in the US will then go and work and do the same sort of thing in the UK. Uh, and sometimes criminal co conduct can span several years in different jurisdictions. And how do you prosecute that? Where do you prosecute that? How do you get the evidence? Those are issues that are very much being dealt with today and have been for the last several years by the Department of Justice and the other regulatory regulators in this country and overseas. It's, it's very much a matter of coordination. Hi, I'm uh, Christian Clark. I'm a 3L. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, I want to ask a little bit about prosecuting in the context of this sort of era of mass incarceration. Um, and, you know, it, there's this growing consensus, too many people in jail, maybe mandatory minimums are too stiff, and it's been that way for too long. Um, and I was curious kind of how you, you know, philosophize about the role of the prosecutor in, in this environment, because, you know, I've had people on one hand say, if you're, um, you know, if concerned about that kind of trend, the best thing you could do is be a, pro a prosecutor because you've got all the power and the criminal defense attorney can't really do anything. Um, I've heard other people on the other hand say, you know, the best approach is to dis disassociate yourself altogether um, and people think that prosecutors do more harm than good. So I was kind of curious, um, how do you sort of think through it? Is it, yeah. uh, well, I'm not a state prosecutor, I'm a federal prosecutor in the yeah, state yeah, district yeah. of New York, and so I, <laughs> I go after it. I've already used that once today, I can't use that again. Um, so it's Steve Cohen, not Yeah, you know, yeah, no, no, I've already, no, look, I, I think, but I think in all things in life, it's, it's not one extreme or the other, it's somewhere in the middle. I do think there's uh, a need for criminal law enforcement to continue, uh, I mean, you can't, it's, nobody can possibly suggest that uh, we should just abandon all criminal, criminal law enforcement because we do have clearly a problem with mass incarceration. The numbers are completely shocking, and I think um, something needs to be done about that. I, there are tremendous proposals going forward. In fact, today, I think, uh, or maybe it was yesterday, there was legislation signed. Uh, Cory Booker is behind a lot of great proposals to, and others, I don't want to miss out credit, on uh, to, to, to bring down mandatory minimums, which is... A cause of a lot of mass incarceration. And if you look at the statistics, I mean, they're horrible in terms of the racial issues. I mean, it's just, you know, the sort of people who are getting caught up in these, uh, in the mass incarceration, there are really big problems. But I don't think the solution is just don't prosecute. And frankly, I, you know, um, I think that ADAs do amazing jobs too. They, you know, people, there are severe crimes being committed. Um, out there and they need to be prosecuted. I think you can't 
you don't want to live in a society where crime is just never prosecuted. I think it requires on people who lead um, you know, criminal law enforcement, whether at the federal or the state level, to be very uh, understanding about what the problem is and to try and exercise prosecutorial discretion in a way that hopefully will ameliorate the problem while some of these broader you know, legislative proposals and other policy proposals are put into effect to solve the problem long term. But it is a problem. And I, I, I really would suggest if you have any interest in, in prosecuting not to, to sort of take some real institutional problem to prevent you from doing something that you might otherwise uh, find tremendously you know, personally fulfilling, professionally fulfilling. And frankly, again, being in the system, I think helps you see its strengths and its weaknesses and puts you in a great position to be a policymaker later on. I mean, these are very big, important policy decisions that need to be made and analyzed and researched. Uh, a lot of great work coming out of this institution and others on these very topics. And uh, if you've been part of the institution, I think you can be very well positioned to understand and to assess the various proposals that come forward. So far from running from the prosecutor's office, <laughs> prosecutorial side of this, um, if you are worried about mass incarceration, I do think it's, it's, a, valuable, it's a valuable job to do. You had, sure, yeah. You had, yeah. Hi, my name is Chen Yuan. I'm also an LM student, come from China. So thank you so much for the talk. And my question is this. When you argue on behalf of the government, can you think of any tough case that you really don't think the chance of winning is that high, but through your persuasion, talents, <laughs> um, uh, every, the, the jury and the judge all like your story and you, turn, you manage to turn the table around? So can you share any of those kind of cases or experience? Uh, um, so I'll tell you, I'll share with you, I, 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 I think uh, a lot of people are persuasive. I think at the end of the day, evidence is what really matters in a court of law. Um, but I will share with you one experience, one of my, um, a big part of my life while I was in the U.S. Attorney's Office is, a, is actually a landmark insider trading case. Um, I prosecuted the um, United States against Todd Newman and Anthony Chason. Is that these are hedge fund portfolio managers, and uh, com they were convicted at trial. They traded in... Um, technology stocks um, called Dell and NVIDIA, and they were four levels removed from the original tipper at the insiders at these institutions. And they were convicted after a six-week trial of securities fraud. And uh, again, it was, it was the evidence. We had cooperating witnesses. We had very strong email evidence. Uh, we convicted them under jury instructions that were uh, essentially approved by the Second Circuit Court of Appeals at the time. And uh, I then argued the case on appeal uh, a year later or so uh, to the Second Circuit. In, uh, I argued for my life because I knew it was a, a problem. We knew the particular members of the Second Circuit were not predisposed to particular, this insight, form of insider trading. And uh, while I thought I was the most persuasive I've ever been, uh, it turns out that the Second Circuit uh, reversed those convictions uh, so you never can tell if you're going to be persuasive or not. You just have to keep fighting, basically. Uh, that case is now uh, the Solicitor General's petition for certiorari in the Supreme Court. And I think we're waiting any, any day now to see where the, where the Supreme Court will take it. Uh, it's sort of one of my great ironies from being in the U.S. Attorney's Office because I spent a lot of time doing insider trading, doing some of the lead cases in insider trading. And uh, that was a, a very important case to the government. And the Second Circuit's decision, I think, has turned back inside a trading law by decades. So uh, notwithstanding you can have best intentions, uh, things, can, uh, things can go wrong. And uh, uh, I think that was a great, great loss for the government by the Second Circuit. And uh, let's see what the Supreme Court does. Hi, my name's David. Uh, thank you again. Um, we've obviously talked at length about your time in the U.S. Attorney's Office, um, and at risk of broad rushing, there's obviously one paper form of why you know private practice might be better. But um, is there anything that you actually enjoy day to day more that you know has brought you back to a large firm? And, and uh, yeah, I actually I, I, I wanted to talk about the U.S. Attorney's because I do think it's a great experience, and I also do firmly believe that if you can spend some part of your career in public service, it's a, it's a great thing. It doesn't have to be a prosecutor's office; can be can be anywhere. 
But I, I love the practice of law. I think I tried to talk about a little bit earlier the intersection of sort of the human side and the regulatory side and, uh, you know, the complex issues that you, you deal with. I represent individuals in investigations. Sometimes they, you know, involve securities law, sometimes antitrust law, and investigating and figuring out what they did, what they knew, piecing it within the larger legal framework, and then advocating on behalf of your client. Uh, again, sometimes it's institutions, sometimes it's individuals. I, to me, that is tremendously, uh, you know, stimulating and rewarding. Uh, you know, sometimes you are successful, sometimes you're not successful, but there is really a very sort of complex overlay of, of rules and regulations out there, of the criminal law, the civil law, and, and individuals who act for a whole host of uh, different reasons and parsing out what that is and representing them is a tremendously satisfying thing. I love practicing law. I think it's a great, it's a great job. I think it's, I, I've enjoyed, I mean, obviously enjoyed the time in the US Attorney's Office, which I've talked about mostly here, but I, I have spent uh, nearly 13 years in the private sector as well as a, as a, as a lawyer, and uh, it's, it's, it's a great job. I'm happy to talk about that more too, so. Hi, uh, my name's Travis, I'm a, I'm a 1L. Um, I was particularly curious about what role discretion plays in prosecution, and particularly what role the economic impact of either an indictment or the charges play when you're dealing with either big corporations or insider trading or indicting individuals all along that range. No, it's a huge, it's a huge factor. There's an enormous uh, amount of debate and internal process that goes on before bringing criminal charges. Uh, first of all, nobody, no prosecutor should ever bring a case they don't believe the defendant or the institution is guilty in. But even when you believe somebody's guilty, you may not have the evidence to prove it. And if you don't have the evidence to prove it, bringing an indictment when you think you can't prove the case, I think causes enormous collateral damage. Uh, and prosecutors are very, very aware of that and really debate at length whether or not to move forward with particular indictment, if it's going to turn someone out of the industry or, you know, ruin their lives, and 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 that often is the effect. It is it is critically important. I think it actually comes back to the question of why the interview process is taken so seriously um, for a U.S. attorney, an assistant U.S. attorney position, precisely because of those judgment calls on when you should or should not move forward with an indictment are some of the most difficult to make and the most important to make. And my name is Kiki, I am a 1L. Um, I'm a non-citizen and had my undergrad education outside the US. I believe it was the same for you when you first started your um, career in the US. So I'm wondering um, how your non-citizen status impact um, on your career, like both negatively and positively. And also, when did you um, finish the transition from like, this is the US to this is my country, like after you gain citizen? Uh, I don't, I, I, well, starting with, um, the, you know, the first question on the transition, I will say, and I do, I do think this is one of the greatest things about America. You know, I showed up my first day of a job in a, in a U.S. law firm and actually had an office partner at the time. So we had two to an office, which some of you may face if you go to a large law firm. And <coughs> there was absolutely no difference between him and me, I'd get the call or he'd get the call depending on who has the time and who has the need. Um, I had to do the same sort of research he had to do to answer the question. Uh, you know, most of the time the questions and issues that come up when you're in a law firm are not necessarily directly on point for something you may have studied at law school. I think law school is about, you know, your own intellectual development more than un being able to answer a particular question when you go out and practice. You will always need to do research. And so one of the greatest things is I felt just like the other guy. Um, and I think that is a tremendous thing about the United States. I think people really underappreciate how seamless it is uh, to walk into an environment like that, even though you grew up somewhere else and you are treated exactly the same. It feels very, it felt very, a very merit-based situation for me. It's whether you could figure out the answer promptly <laughs> enough to, to, to satisfy the people that you were working for. And I think that is, uh, 
again, as I say, one of the greatest things about being in this country. Um, when did I feel American? I mean, I think I'm a little bit of both. I mean, I, you know, if you grew up in, I have a friend who grew up in Nebraska and has lived in New York for the last 20 years, and you ask him, well, do you think you're a Nebraskan or a New York person? I mean, it's, you know, I don't know that he would have an, any better answer than I do. I, uh, your upbringing shapes who you are, but uh, I've now spent more years in this country than I spent in Australia. And, um, you know, it's been a great journey. <laughs>